It was a routine mission in Somalia. The U.S. Joint Special Operations Force, Task Force Ranger, were going to land in hostile territory, capture two operatives, and get out. But something had gone terribly wrong. A Black Hawk helicopter, one of their escape routes, had been hit by a rocket-propelled grenade. The surviving crew inside now lay trapped deep in a maze of buildings and hollowed-out warehouses, and the enemy was closing in from all sides. Welcome to Covert, a show about the shadowy world of international espionage and top-secret military operations. I'm Jamie Rennell, and I'm going to take you inside history's greatest special operations missions to learn about the brave soldiers who risked their lives to terminate the world's most wanted, eliminate terrorist threats, and protect countless innocent lives, as told by the people who were there. We came in with the audacity that we could just kick in doors and take down who we wanted, and they were going to fight back. I mean, that's what you would do if they showed up in your neighborhood. Kenny Thomas, Randy Romiglio, and the rest of Chalk Team 3 knew there was no time to hesitate when the helicopter went down. They had to reach it before the enemy did. This is the real story of Black Hawk Down, Part 2. On the ground in Mogadishu, Kenny and Randy turned into a quiet alley and they checked the rooftops for any signs of enemy movement. For now, they appeared to be safe. And at that point, all of a sudden, you hear the sky just erupts. I mean, it's the most deafening. I don't remember much noise about my ears went numb, but that one, I remember how it was bone rattling. The Rangers picked up their pace. They needed to get to that downed helicopter, and soon. The U.S. helicopter hurtled past them, it hovered only feet above their heads and set off a barrage of heavy artillery fire. The stream of bullets narrowly skimmed over them. Randy and Kenny dropped to the ground. Why was the Army helicopter shooting at them? It was a little bird was coming in right over our heads and doing a gun run. And those mini guns are, they're churning and it's like, bah! and there was casings falling all around us. Kenny followed the fire with his eyes and saw dozens of enemy fighters falling to the ground. And when you saw him light up the street and you got a glimpse of who was out there, like, oh my gosh, and that's when you know, I first realized how many people were up against. One of the little bird pilots had identified a large group moving up a roadway that we were blinded to. And if it hadn't been for the little birds, those, that element would have walked right up onto us. And according to the Little Bird pilot, it was a platoon-sized element, which could have been anywhere from 15 to 30 men. Um, so that Little Bird pilot single-handedly saved us. Their lives had been spared from a threat they had known nothing about. Meanwhile, across the city, the convoy General Garrison had sent back to save the Rangers was on its way. The armored trucks were originally meant to be the Rangers' escape route. But now, the trucks were under such heavy fire that they needed backup themselves. Don Mann is a former Navy SEAL commander who knew some of the Rangers involved. There's so many people wounded. Um, a friend of mine was shot twice each leg. I had another friend, another SEAL who was shot. He had a knife on the side of him, and his hip took a beating. He didn't know why his hip hurt all of a sudden, and his knife was broken in half, and the AK round went through the knife and broke his knife. I mean, people were getting shot up badly. So these fighters on all sides of the street in the buildings, they had easy, easy, it's like shooting ducks, you know, it was just nothing to it. So it was a, a terrible, terrible experience for the guys on the ground. Unfortunately, because of problems within that convoy, the convoy actually became lost within the city. Garrison realized that the convoy wouldn't be able to reach the men anytime soon. Instead, he would have to rely on the helicopters to support them. And this, in and of itself, was a risk. Dr. Clayton Chun is the author of Gothic Serpent, Black Hawk Down, Mogadishu, 1993. The one weapon that was most 
dangerous to the to the American forces was rocket propelled grenades. They're very cheap. They're very easy to use. Um, a charge, a propellant charge that could destroy a vehicle or that could uh, damage a helicopter. The rocket-propelled grenade that had taken down the first copter wasn't the only one. Somalis with these grenades were lying in wait all over the city. As the crew waited on the convoy, a search and rescue team roped down from above. But a half a mile away from the crash site, a second Black Hawk was targeted. From the base, Garrison and his team watched in horror as the second helicopter spiraled down and crashed. Among those watching with bated breath was Lieutenant Larry Moores. When the second one went in, it, it didn't change the focus. It just uh, ramped up the intensity. Once again, there were survivors, some of the crew on board and one of the pilots, Mike Durant. And once again, the Somali forces began to swarm. We knew we were going to go back out there and, and as long as it took uh, to get to those objectives and, and bring our... Uh, our ranger partners home. So. There was no immediate rescue crew available. A third Black Hawk hovering above had been covering fire. On board, two Delta snipers requested to be dropped to the crash site to protect Durant and his crew. Sergeants Gary Gordon and Randy Chagart roped down, but were quickly surrounded. Meanwhile, the convoy was still unable to break through to the first crash site. So all I wanted to do was be out there with them and, and be a part of the effort. So. After a long while, Garrison came to a distressing decision. The rescue convoy was becoming combat ineffective. He had no choice but to pull them out. And I remember thinking, no matter what decision is made there right now, there is nothing that can be done to help us. And that was very sobering, and, and, and that, was, that, that was discouraging. But the, the reality of it is, and with anything that happens in our disasters and floods and death and, and family problems, the reality is that it is happening, and now what are you going to do about it? All right, guys, let's talk numbers. First one, 100,000. That's the number of hairs on the average head. 66, the percentage of men who will lose that hair by the age of 35. Okay, last one, five. That's the number of dollars and the number of minutes you need to spend to start doing something about it. Don't believe me? Go to forhims.com slash ops to see for yourself. Hims is the one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, sexual wellness, and now oral care for men. Hims connects you with real doctors and medical grade solutions to treat hair loss, acne, ED, and even cold sores. They sell well known generic equivalents to name brand prescription. It's the real deal. It's not something you find at like a gas station. And if you order now, covert listeners can get a trial month of Hims for just five bucks today, right now, while supplies last. See the website for full details. Look, this would cost you hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. So go to forhims.com slash ops. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash O P S. Forhims.com slash ops. Because you've only got one head. Let's take care of it. Back at the first crash site, Kenny and Randy heard the news. Most of the American troops were scattered on the roads and alleys surrounding the first crashed Black Hawk. They began to form a defensive perimeter around the downed aircraft and wounded men. It was just putting guys in the right spots, in the right vantage points, to prevent or to minimize the amount of uh, fire we were receiving from the enemy. Chalk 3, including Kenny and Randy, took up positions near a main road, where they were surrounded by a baying mob. But they had a piece of heavy artillery on their side, an M60 machine gun. The M60 was the heavy weapon that was attached to the squad. And it served the same pur purpose as the saw, but it was just of, of a he heavier caliber. The M60 actually had was a 30 caliber bullet versus a 5.56 uh, diameter. 
Enemy fire suddenly hit the M60 gunner. Not missing a beat, Kenny took over. We needed that M60 there. And we were gonna do whatever it took to keep that M60 there. I jumped behind the gun and two guys that were just popping their heads up over a, over a little retaining wall, it was about this high. Just popping up and doing the, doing the Mogadishu machine gun man, which is not even aiming and just spraying rounds. So I got behind the gun, I waited for those guys to stick their heads up and fired off a couple of rounds. I was like, bah, bah, bah. and then the, the gun goes click, click, choo, choo, choo. and I'm like, what the? It's out of rounds. When everybody's yelling at me, um, Sergeant Watson, they're like, he's going, use the law. And I'm like, what? Because the law on your back. And I had been carrying around this light anti tank weapon, the law, for about two months and just had forgotten that I had it. It, it was, I was so used to it slinging across my back that I'm like, oh, I have a rocket launcher. So he pulled the rocket launcher out and fired it off. And nobody was shooting from that position anymore, so that was pretty effective, I guess. And that was very effective at uh, dissuading the Somalis from coming back to that corner. But by now, there were fewer than 100 men protecting the crash site, and the number of Somalis was steadily growing outnumbering the Americans at least 10 to 1, most of them with close links to Adid's clan. The typical Somali militiaman uh, views that clan is the most important aspect. They don't look at the nation of Somalia. They look at clan first, family first. Uh, it's, it's, it's as if then that they are onto themselves their own uh, nation. They will do almost anything for the clan. It's clan first. They are not the most educated of individuals, but are willing to fight. They're, and that's what I think Adid really focused in on. That was one of the big advantages, because they're willing to die. There was, some, there was some use of an addictive drug called cat that would more like more speed up necessarily their motivation uh, uh, to do certain activities. So it's almost like being on a on a amphetamine that, that it's going to drive you to to uh, take certain actions, maybe provide you that extra uh, oomph or that strength to to carry on. We came in with the audacity that we could just kick in doors and take down who we wanted and they were going to fight back. I mean, that's what you would do if they showed up in your neighborhood. That's what I would do. It, it, it had nothing to do with what I was smoking, drinking, or, or who my clan leader was. It doesn't come down to something that they believe in. It's that you're fighting because these people are in your streets killing your clansmen and we're going to fight to keep each other alive. The Rangers were struggling to keep each other alive. Sergeants Gordon and Sugart were fending off attacks from the second site, but they were running short on ammo. Both soldiers fought to the end, but they were both killed in action. The Somalis overran the site, killing the rest of the crew and taking the injured pilot, Michael Durant, hostage. At headquarters, part of the original convoy had finally made its way back to base. Garrison decided to send it straight back in to the second crash site, this time with reinforcements, among them none other than Lieutenant Larry Moores. Um, we knew we were going immediately back in, so uh, uh, very difficult to, to let them know after they'd just been shot up pretty good, hey, we're, we're heading right back in, uh, let's get our... Uh, our mindset right. Let's uh, let's get back in there, and uh, and, and get up to uh, uh, crash site two. So as soon as we were able to get all, all of our personnel back in the vehicles, uh, we departed uh, to go back into the city. I think there's an anxiety uh, from most people uh, on going into a, a a big firefight like that. As we offloaded casualties, uh, we knew the severity of, of, of going back out into the city uh, on successive trips. Uh, so there was uh, a nervousness, but there also was uh, a part of the way uh, we do business in the Rangers, and we knew we were going to go back out there and, and as long as it took uh, to get to those objectives and, and bring our, uh, our Ranger partners home. So. The new convoy rolled out, feeling more prepared for this rescue mission but the Somalis were prepared as well. Uh, but the Somalis had uh, set up a huge roadblock, had totally uh, blocked the road so we couldn't get through at all when we were hit by a, a very large uh, ambush type setup, hit by a, a series of RPGs followed by uh, you know, 
high volume of uh, small arms fire to try and keep us from getting up there to that crest up. And we were receiving fire uh, at every intersection uh, pretty much uh, as we fought our way towards uh, crash site two. Uh, Lieutenant Moore's convoy was held up in the middle of the city and even further from the men on the ground at crash site one. At the site, news of the convoy's slow progress reached the ground. You can hear the radio transmissions. We start looking at each other um, with concern because we had never been on the ground this long and we had never received this much resistance. We had never heard the little birds making as many gun runs as they had and, and the convoy had never received this amount of fire. That was where I really felt, I believe, discouraged. At base, the watching General Garrison saw that there was no way for the convoy to make its way through the maze of blocked city streets. And he made the unfortunate call once again. He pulled them back to base a second time. Reluctantly, the men in the convoy followed their orders. It been a most difficult decision for him because he knew that, that potentially if he did nothing uh, to save those individuals, he, he would have another repeat of, of maybe a massacre. Conversely, he had to weigh, weigh the risk of having even more casualties. Uh, from my perspective, I wanted to fight into the objective, uh, but from a leadership perspective, they're making a command and control decision. Do we really want to insert four more Humvees who can't support themselves for a long fight? Uh, we just create a bigger problem. 6.30 p.m. The surrounded men at the crash sites were no nearer to being rescued. Night fell on Mogadishu. It had been three hours since the mission began. Near the first crash site, Kenny and Randy defended their positions against the mob in now almost pitch black darkness. The Somalis, though, had a critical advantage. They knew every inch of ground. They would fire um, randomly to try to see your muzzle flash. And then at that point, once they figured out where you were, they would try to maneuver on you. And, and remember, these are their neighborhoods. They're not our neighborhoods. So when you start taking casualties, we have a thing called a casualty collection point. You start bringing people in. The, the thing that obviously made sense, and the Delta guys had already done this, was kick in a door, take over the house, use that as a collection point. And that's what we needed to do. We started bringing in our wounded guys into these buildings. The men broke open the door to a home two blocks from the crash site. Inside, they steeled themselves for the long night ahead. And so the immediate thing was to get the guys inside. And then they decided, all right, get out of the streets. Help's coming. Let's, let's bring everybody in. It's starting to get dark. But I will say this. When, when we realized we weren't getting out of there, um, I think we almost welcomed the nightfall. Because at that point, that's where we mostly trained. Now, granted, we didn't know the lay of the neighborhood or the lay of the land, per se. Um, and this was their backyard. But under the cover of darkness, we felt we were, we were better trained. And that's where we would um, be more effective. It was dark. The moon wasn't up. The, there were no s stars out yet. You couldn't see a whole lot more than just shadowy figures. And you could hear the bad guys moving in to the positions that we had just occupied less than a block away. Because you could hear the clinkety clanks and the mumbling and feet shuffling. And you could see shadow figures moving. And at this point, I know the three of us were sitting out there, at least I was thinking, and this is, what are we doing? Like, we're rangers. Like every bit of our training has been about going on the aggressive and attacking. You fight through an ambush. You don't fall back and retreat from an ambush. The fighters took up defensive positions inside the house. But as the evening darkness began to creep in, they realized they did not bring an essential piece of kit into the battle. A lot of us didn't bring night vision um, or even water, for that matter, because we didn't anticipate being on the ground this long. Because we didn't bring our night vision because we assumed that the mission would be done before nighttime. Because every other one that we'd ever done had always been done in time, you know, we got them done. Assumptions, in that case, are just another form of complacency. 
General Garrison watched as his operation descended into chaos. The only way to get his men out was to launch another convoy. But having failed twice, Garrison started to realize that he couldn't do it with his forces alone. He needed support from other United Nations troops in Somalia. How, how do you get the forces out? Well, the trucks and the Humvees that the army had were basically all shot up. You had to rely on something else. That something else were armored vehicles. Whether they are tanks from the Italians, the Indians, or the Pakistanis, you, you needed that some way to break through those blockades and to protect the convoys. To do that, you're going to need not only those vehicles, but drivers and, and other support personnel. Who could provide that? It would only be the UN. All right, I'm going to admit something to you. I'm getting old, but I'm really happy about my new Casper mattress. It's not just that I'm sleeping better. I actually feel better. You know, it's hard for me to concentrate with a stiff neck or a sore back. And like I said, I'm old. And my old mattress wasn't doing me any favors. But all of Casper's products are designed to mimic the human shape, providing supportive comfort for all kinds of bodies. The original Casper mattress combines multiple layers of supportive memory foams for a great night's sleep with just the right amount of sink and bounce, which I can definitely attest to. They also have a selection of other mattresses and pillows and sheets, everything you could possibly need for a great night's sleep. And because they sell directly to you, you're not paying for some random middleman. And they send it in that tiny little box, which is just crazy. And if you don't love it, you know, they'll take it back. Free shipping and returns in the U.S. and Canada. You can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. You'll get 50 bucks towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com backslash covert and using promo code covert at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. That's 50 bucks off of selected mattresses, casper.com backslash C-O-V-E-R-T, and use the promo code COVERT at checkout. casper.com backslash COVERT, promo code COVERT. Pretty easy to remember. Getting the troops together was something that might take more time than they had. I was exhausted at this point, and I got against the wall, and I just slid onto the floor. And I tried to reposition, and I moved myself back up the, the wall. And then I started rubbing my hands together because they felt very odd. They felt wet. And there was a, there was some sort of light source. I don't know if it was a candle or, or a light. But I remember I looked at the floor, and I could see the light reflecting off the floor. And what I realized, it looked like the floor was wet, and it was. It was wet from blood. And soon after that, uh, I could... Not only did you, you see the light reflection, but you could actually smell the blood in the room. And when I first walked into the room, I smelt... I, I did smell it, I just didn't recognize what it was until I was sitting in it. Once I realized I was sitting in it, I was tired enough to where I didn't even care to move. As the early evening turned over into night, the Americans were paying the price for their earlier overconfidence. Um, it became quite apparent that we had to um, be disciplined with, with, what, with whatever we were using, whether it was ammunition, medical supplies, so on and so forth. So at this point in the night, it was quite clear that we were running out of stuff. Basically, we got complacent because we were happy not to carry more gear. We're like, I don't want to carry any more gear. I won't bring my night vision. It wasn't anyone told you don't bring it. Just we didn't think we needed it. But we learned it's better to have and not need than the need and not have. One of their men was bleeding to death. They desperately needed more morphine and IV bags. If they didn't get more supplies, they wouldn't survive the night and Garrison faced yet another crucial decision. A helicopter drop was the only way to resupply his men, but with two downed Blackhawks and more RPGs still out there, he was hesitant to dispatch them. Doing nothing is not an option. So he takes the responsibility, I have to send a helicopter out there to, to drop supplies, and that's what he does. He ordered the launch of yet another Blackhawk helicopter, and with the havoc in the city, 
the pilot would need to be guided in by the man on the ground. You have to land those supplies in a certain area where you can get access to them. You land on the wrong place, then you, all you're doing is giving supplies to the Somalis. They had forgotten their night vision goggles, but all the American troops still carried infrared strobes. The lights were invisible to the Somalis, but they beamed a signal into the air that allowed the pilot to spot the landing zone with night vision sights. The men prepared for the drop. Reading you loud and clear. Okay, one mile pig. That's 100 feet into the wind. Altitude is good. Okay, that's 75 feet and you're in a good position. The Black Hawk was close to ground. The plan was going smoothly. Then, a hail of fire. And he just had to sit there, hover, and take it. He knows that bird's getting hit, man. Ding, 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 ding. You know, and he has to sit there and take it because he knows there's guys counting on him. It's not about like, I don't know, man, it's pretty hairy. I don't want to go in there. What? Are you kidding me? That's not how it works. The Black Hawk managed to stay in the air and made the drop. Side of the, well, the bird was hovering right over the building, so they just kicked him out, and it was, you know, guys right outside the building. And it, much needed supplies that, that you could argue kept one of our guys, Rodriguez, alive. You know, he was going low on fluids. They didn't have anything else to, to keep his body from collapsing. The helicopter turned and struggled its way back to base, riddled with bullets. Now the men on the ground could hold out a while longer, hopefully long enough for General Garrison to find them a way out. And Garrison had finally been making headway. The other UN forces had agreed to let him use their tanks and armored personnel carriers in the next convoy. If uh, the Malaysians and the Pakistanis uh, were uh, committed to going in with us, uh, which we give them a lot of credit for, uh, they didn't have any uh, trapped personnel on that objective. Uh, but they accepted that role to go out there with us and, and fight all night. The new, heavily armored, multinational convoy was set to leave from nearby Newport and headed into the city. Half of the convoy would steer towards the second crashed helicopter. They needed to blow it up to be sure its high-tech weaponry didn't fall into enemy hands. The rest of the convoy would push north towards the surrounded men at the first crash site. It was eight hours after the raid was launched, but now the final rescue convoy was making its way. And once again, it included Lieutenant Larry Moores. Anybody that was uh, ready to go, uh, able to go out and fight that night, uh, we took with us. So there was uh, some uh, intel analysts, there was a couple of wounded rangers who uh, were able to take a, you know, a cast off their arm because they wanted to go, uh, they wanted to be part of the mission. The convoy was also accompanied by Corporal Robert Lowhead, a Humvee driver assigned to the 10th Mountain Division. And that didn't matter if it were special operations, um, Rangers, or even the 10th Mountain Division. It was just, we had people in trouble. And at that point we knew it was, it was us against the country. And we didn't, we didn't have time to think about it. We just did it. The convoy fought towards the surrounded men, but as ready as they were, the multinational force had never trained together. The result was confusion. They were running out in the street, taking pot shots at us. You could look up on a roof or into a window and see them shooting. You could see guys get shot right in front of you, to the back of the knee. Somebody get shot in the hand and drop their rifle in the street and just, it was, it was chaos. As people start driving toward the uh, crash site, the first two Malaysian condors get hit by RPGs. Under heavy fire, the Malaysian soldiers went in the wrong direction, causing more delay. And the radio is like, they're en route. They're not en route. They're en route. They're not en route. And it was like, this, you know, at some point you just gave up. Listen, if you wanted to know how far the convoy got, just listen, because you could hear them firing it up. As the exhausted soldiers kept themselves alive and fought off the surrounding battalions, the convoy battled through the night for nearly three hours. Finally, it broke through the battalion. And then people on the rooftops and in the alleyways and every door shooting at you, that's what we were trying to get through. I believe at that point we thought it was, it was pretty much over. 
we were glad to see him, and we were all very tired. And you kind of get the sense, okay, well, this thing's finally done. We can get our wounded guys out of here, and we're, we're waiting around. It's getting the, the lights coming up, and the bad guys are going to be there. They're, they're waking up. It's not like they went away, but they're still there. And then you start hearing a couple shots, huh? and, and then all of a sudden a rocket comes zipping across the street again and blows up, and it's like, oh, that'll wake you up. That'll get you up in the morning. The men at the crash site loaded up the casualties. At long last, they prepared to head off to home. But General Garrison had one final challenge for them. The Ranger Creed dictates the Americans can't leave a man behind. The casualties from the long night of fighting were aboard the convoy. Garrison also wanted his men to bring home the body of the crashed helicopter pilot. Yes, this was something we had to do. It was the right thing. It was not a question that we were going to leave the body behind. The body was still trapped inside the crushed cockpit. To get it, they would have to free it. And this delay could mean that they would lose their cover of darkness. It became a fight against time, uh, dismantling that aircraft uh, to remove him, uh, to bring him home with us. Robert Lowhead's Humvee was called into action. Well, they started out by attaching some toe straps to the tail end of my Humvee. At first, we tried to pull the Humvee out into a wider intersection out of the alley so we could get more free access to it. Um, or so the guy's good. But as expected, the delay gave the Somali forces more time to attack. It was definitely the longest night in my life. And you just have the adrenaline going, you have your senses are on fire, you smell everything. And for me, I had night vision goggles, so I was seeing everything to an extent. Every sense that you can have in your body was alert and alive. And so you knew, you knew what was going on around you. It took an additional three and a half hours, but the rescue team finally recovered the dead pilot's body. Now they could finally head home. We're getting the hell out of here. I don't care what's in front of us. Finding good people is always challenging, but there's one place that you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. A place where growing businesses can connect to qualified candidates. And that place is ZipRecruiter.com slash covert. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. But that's just the beginning. With their power matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience. And then they invite them to apply for your job. And as the applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so that you never really miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. That's right, the first day. With results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rated hiring site in America. And right now, Covert listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address. ZipRecruiter.com slash covert. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash C-O-V-E-R-T. ZipRecruiter.com slash covert. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. It was easier said than done. The convoy had fought its way in. And now, it had to fight its way out. Through a heavily defended maze of streets toward a UN-held stadium in the north of the city. But for Randy and Kenny, the danger wasn't over yet. The armored convoy didn't have space for them. At that point, the plan was to run out next to the armored vehicles. We had an armored vehicle to run next to which was fine until we got to the first intersection. And that armored vehicle didn't stop for us. It kept going. And as it, they were crossing this intersection, it sounded like someone had picked up a handful of pebbles and were throwing it against sheep. That tink, 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 which was bullets bouncing off the armored vehicles. And I remember thinking, we're going to have to run through that. And soon, the only vehicles were gone, and we started running. 
The truck made its way across the street through a gauntlet of gunfire, and now it was the Ranger's turn to cross. But unlike the armored convoy, bullets wouldn't just bounce off them. I'm a pretty fast guy, but I'm not that fast. I can't, I can't keep up with vehicles. And they put the pedal down, man, took off. And that left about 30 of us ran from that city. They had nothing to lose. Kenny and Randy aimed their M4 assault rifles toward the rebels and wildly sprayed the enemy position with all the ammunition they had. As they closed in on the rebel fighters at the edge of the city, Randy took a direct hit from an AK-47 round. It looked like somebody hit him with a baseball bat um, on the shoulder. It felt like somebody had walked up and struck me with a baseball bat. So once I realized I had been shot, um, I reached into my body armor to check for an exit wound. I expected to hear a gurgling, and when I didn't gurgle, I realized that I was still, my lungs were still intact, I could still move, I could still breathe, um, which was of relief. But I knew that I was okay enough to keep moving forward. That's when I got angry. Is a, is a driving force. It's very powerful. So at that point, I knew that I was getting out of there one way or another. Outnumbered, outgunned, and outmaneuvered, the Rangers needed a miracle. Then Randy looked up at the long road in front of him. And there was a big tank sitting there. And you have to remember, we had been, you're tired, um, dehydrated, and you've been fighting for how many hours now? When I initially saw that tank, all I could think of was, how did they get a tank? And then it soon dawned on me, it was painted white, it was a UN on it, it was a Pakistani tank. Um, it proceeded to fire and level a building and we made a left right there into the basement or first level of a blown out building. With one hit, the Pakistani owned UN tank took out the entire enemy position. I started feeling dizzy, I could smell my own blood. We kept running and there was an armored carrier. We actually caught up to an armored personnel carrier. And I ran up and opened the door and I was told that it's full. And I said, the hell it is. Kenny and Randy scrambled on board the UN vehicle heading to the safety of the UN held football stadium. The long road from the crash site to the base became known as the Mogadishu Mile. And we walked into the stadium, and um, in some ways it felt like like gladiators. When you're walking into the stadium, making your entrance. The, the, the difference was, is this wasn't the entrance, this was the end. As our task force came back together that morning, uh, it, was, it was a very emotional sight. But you know, when you look at each other, you don't have to say anything, because you know you gave it everything you could. That was the first time I felt safe. But the reality of what taken, had just taken place over the course of the 17 hours was starting to set in. And the emotion just comes out of you. And I, I remember I started tearing up. And Randy walked up to me and he was asking me if I, I was okay. And I remember I had apologized to him a while later saying, man, I'm sorry that I, I, didn't, I didn't even think to ask, you know, how, how's your wound? Like he was worried about me and he was the guy with a get a hole in his back but I, you know, at that time it was enough to know he was alive because I, I knew by then you know we had lost guys and I knew it was it was pretty it was a big deal 14 hours later task force rangers ordeal was finally over for those who had survived the ground general garrison counted the cost of the mission 18 Americans, one Malaysian peacekeeper, and 500 Somalis were dead. Worse still, the bodies of the crew from the second crash site had been mutilated and dragged through the streets in front of video cameras. One day, the person that you're hanging out with in the chow hall is there, and they're your best friend, and you have literally put your life in their hands. You have that kind of faith in each other. And then one day, they're just gone. Gone. For what? because that thing blew up and killed him. And, you're, and, you're, and you just have to sit there and take it. You don't get to go to the funeral. You don't get to go home and have your friends surround you and hug you. You don't get to take the day off. You just have to take it and you gotta deal with it. And when do you think that you deal with it? It's when you come home. 
And that's the hard part. And some people have, most of us, have very healthy ways of dealing with it. You have a family around you, you have a community around you. Some people don't have that. And that's, that's a tough one for them. The aftermath got worse. The Somalis broadcast images of the captured helicopter pilot, Michael Durant. 11 days after the raid, he was released. But the humiliation caused outrage in the United States. General Garrison would later write to President Clinton, saying that the full responsibility of what had happened rested with himself and not with Washington. In March 1994, U.S. troops withdrew from Somalia. A year later, the U.N. followed suit. In the years since the Black Hawk Down mission, the men who fought in Somalia remained proud of what they had achieved. And in the end, the mission did succeed. Adid's two underlings were both captured alive. You know, we were there to accomplish a mission, and we did accomplish the mission. Um, yeah, we got our nose bloodied in the fight, but we won the fight. The men of Task Force Ranger did everything they could to bring their comrades home. Their fighting spirit will ensure this mission will go down in Special Forces history. Because it's life and death, and you know that you had every opportunity to step out of the fight. Guys could have done it, we, nobody would have known. You could have stepped behind a wall and messed around with your gear and been like, I needed to take a break or I need a breather. Nobody did because they were fighting for each other because they knew if they stepped out of it, it would leave someone hanging. And it, you weren't gonna do that to your, your, to your, to your, to your ranger buddies. You weren't gonna do it to anybody. And that's, that's what I saw. That's what that, that feeling sticks with you for life. Did we represent the Ranger Creed well? I, I believe so, and it's more than leaving a fellow comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. It was, um, you know, under no circumstances will I ever embarrass my country. Um, and never shall I fail my comrades. Those are other aspects of the creed that I think were well represented uh, during the battle and are often overlooked. That's all for Covert Season 1. We'll be back soon for Season 2. Special thanks to everyone who subscribed, listened, and reviewed us. We definitely appreciate it. Covert is an audio boom and world media rights co-production, hosted by me, Jamie Rennell. It is produced by Audio Boom's Ben Hosley and Rachel Jacobs, and by Pascal Hughes for World Media Rights. We had editing help by David Markowitz, with additional production from World Media Rights by Gerald Zabengua and Damian Thorpe. David McNabb is the series creative director, and the executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. Don't forget to follow us on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. And if you have the time, leave us a review. <laughs>